Yo, Dragon Gang, what's up, fire folks and blood boys? <laughs> How's it going, incest freaks? Sorry, let's try that again. Sup, losers, I'm Glidus, but you can call me any one to four syllable word or word adjacent series of sounds that vaguely adhere to English phonotactics and begin with gl, apparently. HBO went ahead and released a pair of trailers for something they made, and I guess we're going to talk about it passes the time, I suppose. So we're going to go through them in a bit of detail and talk about what they mean. No spoilers for future plot points in this video, except what's already shown in these trailers and the teaser from a few months back. Please keep the comments unspoiled too. Nobody thinks you're cool for knowing what happens. We all know what happens. And don't worry, my analysis isn't really going to suffer for not being explicit about spoilers. Some mar marketing genius decided to bring the story's factionalism into real life by cleaving this trailer drop in twain. One half for the goofy greens, and the other for the batty blacks. We'll talk about this marketing strategy later, but for now let's start with the blacks. Let's get into the trailer breakdown. Oh my god, I'm doing a trailer breakdown. Lord deliver me. What have I become? What have you people done to me? Top 10 things you did notice in, in, the, in the black trailer. Number 10. Aegon's cape. You can see in this shot that Aegon does a cool little twirl move with his cape when he sits on the throne. But where did he learn this move? And what does it mean? What is Aegon's true power level coming into season two? Number nine, Caraxi's neck. Neck. Fans of the series have been wondering for over a year exactly when we'll get to see the piping hot flying giraffe lizard again. And this trailer delivers. Look at his neck. Look at it. Number eight. Burger King for- Okay, no, we're, we're not doing that. Let's talk about this dragon trailer like normal people. The trailer opens with a little self-contained trailer for itself, where Rhaenyra looks slay, some key art tells us that all must choose. Matt Smith, in a nightgown, sleepily wanders around while we hear him screaming about doing war for his wife. Typical husband stuff. Eric Cargill wiggling a sword around, Caraxes singing in the rain. Then the trailer tells us that the trailer is starting now, and the Targaryen said, shines in red and black. So this beginning sets up a violent and decisive tone. The black trailer for real this time opens on Luke Valarian's funeral on Dragonstone. You can clearly see Corlys and Rhaenys, Baylor and Rhaena, a big thing on fire, then Rhaenyra, Joff and Jace. You'd think this funeral for Luke would happen pretty much straight away in the season, but at the end of season one, Jace was sent off on a mission to get the support of the Eyrie and of Winterfell, so this has to happen after he's returned. We see Jace at the wall in the trailer, having come there from Dragonstone. Game of Thrones famously played it fast and loose with Daenerys fast travelling between these two locations, so it'll be interesting to see how House of the Dragon juggles continental dragon rides in its plot. Unclear, but what is clear is that Rhaenyra is mega upset, so this is definitely about Luke. There's this beautiful shot of a dragon flying to Harrenhal. We've seen Harrenhal a lot in this franchise, but never from this angle, which means we get our first glimpse of the Isle of Faces, the mysterious island in the Lake Harrenhal overlooks, the God's Eye. House of the Dragon seems to be more invested in the magical parts of Gurm's universe than Game of Thrones was, and a character in Fire and Blood is said to have gone to the Isle of Faces to commune with the ancient green men who live there in secret, guarding the sacred weirwoods. This is Cyrax flying towards Harrenhal, you can tell from the pixels. Harrenhal changed hands many times in the main series, and it's currently the seat of Larry Strong. It's always been one of my favourite settings, and it's a major location throughout House of the Dragon story, so I'm excited to see more of it. I'm not sure why Rhaenyra is flying to it from the west though, that's a bit weird. Maybe she was checking out the Westerlands or the Reach for some reason, or maybe Riverrun. Back on Dragonstone, we see Rhaenyra struggling to understand what Missaria is talking about. Yeah, that's that's Missaria wearing white. She, she's the white worm. Remember? Do you remember House of the Dragon? It's in the trailer. I'm not spoiling you any more than HBO are. I won't tell you what they're talking about though. Their secret is safe with me. It is very important though, and it'll be interesting to see these two women so strongly associated with Damon finally interact. They've both been hurt by Damon, but they've also both recently been hurt by the high tower power in King's Landing. Aemon just killed Rhaenyra's son, and Otto had Missaria his house burnt down. Oh, Masaria survived that, by the way, in case you in case you thought otherwise. 
What a twist! We then see Cyrax crying out on a beach north of Storm's End. So this will be Rhaenyra finding physical proof that her son is dead, maybe for closure in her grief. In the book, Luke's body is never found. After all, Vega chomps Luke pretty cleanly. We don't know how often dragons defecate, but it seems unlikely that Luke would be nearby or at all recognizable. To me, this looks like it's Arax's head and neck. In this promo image, Jace is holding a bunch of Luke's clothes, so it looks like that instead of burning Luke's self, they're burning his stuff. All this time, Rhaenyra's been talking about how she needs to fight and win this war to uphold her father's belief that she, the firstborn child, should succeed him. Aegon is framed as Alicent's son instead of my half-brother, evoking the interpersonal conflict between these two former definitely just platonic friends. Aegon walks into the throne room and sits the Iron Throne with more style than has any other king before or since. Like, yeah, Rhaenyra, sure, you're inherent was usurped by power-hungry conspirators with blatant sexism as an excuse, I hear you, but have you considered that Aegon has undeniable swagger and is a hopeless little fiend that I can't stop thinking about? But then I remember what he did to that girl and those kids, but then I remember what you did to that one random guy. Reminder, everyone on this show sucks, except for Helena. Anyway, it's dinner time, it appears to be an A-tier meal, and we see a few new faces. I'm pretty confident that from left to right we've got Adam of Hull, Hugh Hammer, and Ulf the White. Rhaenyra is making this speech to convince them to help her win this war, loving the shoulder dragons incidentally. In the season 1 finale, Damon mentions some of the Black's dragons that don't have riders. Is Rhaenyra going to ask these people to try and claim these dragons? Yes, at least that's what I would do if I were her. There's a few cool shots of Rhaenyra preparing to mount Cyrax, while Jace tells Craig and Stark and us, the audience, that the realm will crumble if people don't honour their oaths from a quarter century ago. We're shown a group of people, mostly a foot, but somely a horse, going for a stroll in the north. These guys might be wearing the black cloaks of the Night's Watch, and it looks pretty damn frosty, so you might wonder if we're north of the wall here, but they're on a road, so that's unlikely. I can't see Jace's new sexy Timbo Charlotte May haircut here. Not sure when he grew that, but he looks much cooler now. More Jon Snow than Jon Snow was. But if Jace is in this group, it makes you wonder where he's going without his dragon, Vermax. Maybe he's going hunting with Craig and Stark to become his friend, as Rhaenyra said they might get along. Nonetheless, we see the two of them chatting atop the walrus. Old mate Craig has ice strapped across his back. That's that's pretty that's pretty cool. It looks like House of the Dragon is greatly expanding Jace's journey north. Maybe at the cost of truncating his stopovers in other places in the book. Did Rhaenyra tell him about Aegon's dream? Will the knowledge of magic and prophecy play a role in the relationship between Joceris Velaryon and Craig and Stark? Starks are back, by the way. House of the Dragon Season 1 was the story about a wealthy family who lost everything. The story of just one family, but Season 2 incorporates more characters from across the realm as the Targaryen familial struggle erupts into continental civil war. War. Then we see Gwen Hightower, Otto's son and Alicent's brother, who Damon wrecked in the episode 1 tournament. You know, cool helmet guy. He's a horse here and looks a little beat up. There are men behind him wearing Aegon's arms, a golden dragon on a green field, so it looks like Gwen is in some sort of battlefield command position. In the book, Otto makes Gwen the second in command of the Gold Cloaks, King's Landing City Watch, but it looks like he's been given a more active role here in the show. It looks like Gwen is watching Cyrax flying towards him, but trailers often do this sort of deceptive cut, and these could be from completely different scenes or even different episodes entirely. We then cut back to an explosive battlefield shot. Would Rhaenyra really put herself in the midst of a battle when she has other dragon riders at her disposal? Everything so far has been completely unimportant, but now we see Aemond Targaryen. That's all, no further comment required. He's in a promo image too. Look at those boots. Otto and Tyland Lannister drippy enough to fill a bucket overnight while Corlys Velaryon cautions Rhaenyra to crush the Hightower beast at its head. While Aegon is the Green's king, Corlys probably means that Aegon's grandpappy and supposed puppet master Otto needs to go. Corlys and his cute sweater might be right about who has called the shots in that faction up until now, but Otto's position isn't necessarily permanent. He has been removed as hand before for his meddling and other characters in King's 
Landing have conflicting motives and they might benefit from Otto no longer being in charge. What I'm saying is that Colis's assessment is informed by his own time in King's Landing dealing with Otto, and that was a long time ago. He might have an outdated idea of what's going on in the Green Camp. He's at Hull, by the way, or at least what I assumed was Hull last season, a city on Driftmark, and this appears to be parting advice to Rhaenyra before he goes off on a naval mission. In the season 1 finale, Corlys suggests cutting off the gullet to choke King's Landing's supply lines, so this is probably him going off to do that, or maybe he's attending to other naval developments elsewhere in the Narrow Sea. You can't imagine the Greens would take this sort of strategic blow lying down, though. There's a promo image of Corlys and Rhaenys having a chat on the docks as well, so it looks like they might be parting ways here too. And there's a promo image of Corlys looking lost at the painted table, so he does something on Dragonstone, I guess. Damon walks through a castle in the rain. Damon announced his plan to take Harrenhal as a strategic base in the middle of Westeros, so this is probably that, and the earlier shot of Cyrax going to Harrenhal might be Rhaenyra meeting up with Damon after this, again from the west for some reason. Maybe she was having tea at Golden Grove. While Damon addresses some lord from atop Caraxes, threatening a house's destruction should they not side with the blacks, we see some King's Landing shots, a pensive, brooding Aegon who looks more lost in life than usual, dressed in all black, Otto walking away from him. Maybe Aegon is rejecting Otto in some way, and Alicent and Helena in a procession also dressed all in black with mourning veils. Rhaenyra is not the only one to suffer great personal loss at the outset of this war. Gurm writes a lot about destructive cycles of vengeance. How far will this spiral go? Who will it take down with it? And which characters will rise above the desire for revenge? As for Damon, we already see him wandering into Harrenhal, so this could be related, but personally I think this is connected to another conflict and another house. But we'll talk about that in the green trailer. Battle time, let's do a battle. You can see fully armoured knights and horses, just look at these guys, riding through a forest. Then Bela, a top moon dancer, swooping over a forest, which might be by a body of water. The parts of Westeros Rhaenyra has current dominion over are mostly islands or coastal regions, so that's scans. This is probably a battle for control over one of those areas. Rhaenys warns Rhaenyra about all that cycles of vengeance stuff I was just talking about. When the desire to kill and burn takes hold and reason is forgotten, we will not even remember what began the war in the first place. Rhaenys' life has been defined by loss, and she's concerned with the motive for setting the country ablaze. This is directly contrasted with Daemon, whose life has been defined by ambition, and he does doesn't seem too concerned. He has his reason. We fight for our queen! The Rainy speech might be from early in the season trying to caution Rhaenyra about her response to Luke's death, or it could be from later on, a piece of advice she gives before going off on a mission, just like the Corliss speech. Meanwhile, we see Aegon beating some guy's head in with a bloody massive rod and Larry watching on, then Vhagar soaring through the clouds with a teeny tiny Aemond on top, and Eric Cargill wiggling a sword in a bedroom. So these might be the violent responses that Rainy was cautioning Rhaenyra about. Out. Damon enters a hall at some castle. He was wet in the Harrenhal shots, so it might not be Harrenhal. Although, it might be Harrenhal. Then we see Rhaenyra watching the sun over the sea by a dragonstone, and she vulnerably reflects that she fears what she has begun, maybe taking Rhaenys' words into consideration after some retaliatory attack or ploy by the Greens. Everyone should listen to Rainey's more. Lastly, Caraxi screams in the rain. It was raining in these earlier Harrenhal shots, so maybe this is Caraxi's declaring victory there as Damon takes it. The beautiful thing about all this is that, having read the book, I have a very good idea of what probably is going on, but even still, I'm not entirely sure. It's fun. I don't want to know exactly what's going to happen. That would make the show boring. So that's the Black trailer. Overall, it's about the cycle of pain and violence and revenge. It gives us lots Lots of hints as to what lots of characters are going to get up to, but still leaves a lot of room for unknowns. The green trailer opens with- Oh my god, I miss you so much. If Rhaenyra is slay, 
Alicent is a massacre. All must choose. We see Aegon's cute little twirl again, Aemond practicing the rogue prince glare on Chimpston Cole, that same shot of Vagar flying through the clouds, then Clomb presumably riding into presumably battle on presumably horseback. Similarly to how Damon was Rhaenyra's hype man, we fight for our queen! Columbo is Aegon's. Then the trailer kindly informs us that it will be beginning now. Thanks, trailer. The Targaryen sigil shines green and gold. Incidentally, the national colours of my country. Don't believe our flag, it's lying. Then the trailer actually begins with a shot that makes me cry deeply. Alicent lighting candles at the same altar she and Rhaenyra prayed at together many years ago. Alicent is now alone. Maybe she's grieving Viserys, but maybe she's grieving someone else. We hear her talking to someone, maybe a new ally she's recruiting, as that was the context of Rhaenyra's speech at the start of the Black trailer. Wait, no, you can see a cane. That, that's Larry. False alarm, everyone! It was just Larry! It was just Larry. She's talking about her justification for defending Aegon's claim to the throne. Viserys wanted Aegon to succeed him. The same way the Black trailer opened with Rhaenyra's justification for defending her own claim. It's like poetry, it's sort of they rhyme. Lovely shot of the dragon pit, Aegon's banners being draped from the Red Keep walls. Is this the same gate Arya wandered into? It's it's definitely the same one Otto left through in episode 5. Council meeting, you see Alicent escorted by the Lord Commander himself, Otto's there, or while too, Jasper Wilde might be hiding behind him, and I think this is Tyland Lannister, now at the position where Lyman B recently sat and died. Rip. Sag. F. L. The council table in this show has actually had pretty consistent positioning. Monarch at the head, except for this scene in episode 9 when Viserys is dead. The hand on the king's right. Lord Commander standing to his left and sitting on his left in order from closest to furthest. Master of Laws. Grand Maester. Master of Coin. Then at the foot of the table is the Master of Ships. The council scene in episode 6 is a little weird. We don't know what official positions Rhaenyra and Alicent have, if any, but but the only person out of place here is Jasper Wilde, and who really cares about him? What I'm getting at is, it looks like Thailand has been promoted to fill the vacant Master of Coin position left by my Hymenopteran hero. Something I failed to point out in my Homeric epic on episode 10 is that the Greens have access to the wealth of King's Landing, the treasury accumulated by the crown during the prosperity of both Viserys reign and that of his predecessor, Joe. So that's another advantage the Greens have going into this war. Extreme close-ups on Rhaenyra as Alicent says the realm will never accept a queen. As Game of Thrones Season 8 proves to us, not only is this correct, it's also justified! This is probably priming us for Rhaenyra making some unlikable decisions at the outset of this conflict. Then the same shots of Aegon fancifully sitting the throne we saw in the black trailer, he's so cute. And then the- oh, the show's coming back. Cool. I love trailers. We see some Hightower men on what appears to be the Red Keep's walls preparing defences, commanded by Arik Cargill. They've got this scorpion that Kyburn pretended to invent, which is basically a crossbow that ate all its vegetables. 130 years before this, Queen Rhaenys, not that one, was defeated by the Dornish when her dragon Meraxes was hit by one of these, and 170 years from now, Bronn wounds Drogon with one, and then Jon Snow's dragon Rhaegal is killed by one in a really weird scene. Well, and he kind of forgot. And then Drogon is fine when there's a shit ton of them. I guess he really meant it that time. So this looks like the Greens are preparing for a draconic assault on King's Landing. Even though Rhaenyra said she wasn't going to do that. So that's 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 a little fun. That's a little interesting. That's a little wacky. We see Daemon Targaryen, the rogue overlooking a military camp. Same as in the teaser. This looks similar to the place where he threatens destruction in the Black trailer. There's also this promo image of Matt Smith in shoulder pads looking like... He's waiting for something to happen at this same location. Otto says to Alison that the Blacks are fighting for vengeance rather than the good of the realm. This sort of echoes what Rainey said to Rhaenyra, but it's Otto saying it, so I don't believe him. I don't know why Alicent is sitting on like a, 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 a moving box. Is someone being kicked out of Red Keep, maybe? 
This shot is in Otto's chambers. They play the most conniving shot of Rhaenyra they could find, then Cyrax flying cutting to a battle scene, same as in the black trailer. In King's Landing, there's a figure who appears to be wearing white behind a gate being stared down by a city watchman. And you can see other gold cloaks in the back there too. Could this guard be accepting a bribe from a nefarious ne'er-do-well? We do hear Aegon speaking of the repercussions of plotting against him. Two people navigate dark tunnels, presumably the vast network of secret tunnels, covert passages throughout the Red Keep. We can infer then that these two people have snuck into King's Landing and are gonna do something naughty that bothers Aegon, likely connected to Aegon beating a guy in the other trailer. And this guy has similar hair to the bloke holding Helena at knife point in the teaser, so you know, connect those dots if you will. Aegon's got a ruby encrusted crown helmet, which might be the coolest thing I've ever seen. He's wearing armor and he prepares to mount his dragon, Sunfire. Is Aegon headed into battle? Like Rhaenyra, it might be foolish of Aegon to do his own fighting, but lots of lords respect a king who participates in his own battles. Viserys lamented to his hand Lionel Strong that he never had the opportunity to galvanize his resolve and earn martial respect in war. But Lionel told him that dying wouldn't have helped, really. Many that are tested only wish to have been spared. We shall see if Aegon throws himself headlong into this war, and if he later wishes to have been spared his own test. He's chatting with Larry here, Lionel's son. It looks like Larry facilitated Aegon beating that guy earlier, and that ingratiates him with the king. What will come of this relationship between the Green King and the mysterious Lord of Harrenhal? Will it echo the relationship between their fathers? And how will it affect Larry's situation with Alicent and Otto? Sunfire, by the way, hell yeah. Slender, sleek, beautiful, Sunfire the Golden. We saw so little of Sunfire in season one, so yay. It looks like the dragon pit's been repaired, so this might not be very early in the season. Alicent tells Aegon that he has no idea the sacrifices that were made to put you on that throne. Earlier, we saw Alicent lighting a candle alone where she once prayed with Rhaenyra, and a crucial point of episode 10 is Otto giving Rhaenyra an artifact of her relationship with Alicent. Alicent gave up the only person she ever ever loved to defend Aegon's claim. But that's not the only sacrifice she's speaking of. Alicent lays down her dignity to maintain a grasp on power in King's Landing by humiliating herself to Laris Strong. In fact, Alicent's entire life has sort of been a story about sacrificing her own agency in service of putting her son on the throne. Marrying Viserys wasn't her own desire, but her father's, her uncle's, her house's. Her actual personal desire was to hold Rhaenyra's hand forever. And she must be a little jealous of Jiminy Kristen, right? House of the Dragon is about people having to make tough decisions, figuring out what they really want in life, and weighing that up against the other forces that lay claim to their destinies. Alicent is a beautiful, tragic example of this. Maybe she's telling Aegon this because he's considering surrendering, and he doesn't know what it costs to get him here. This scene is in the King's Chambers, where Viserys used to hang out sometimes, and where he died that one time. The room where Alicent's life changed forever, where she was raped by an ostensibly good king. Now, a different rape lives here. Progress. We shall see if this one is a good king. This table is where the massive model of Valyria was. Maybe it's in the basement now. In any case, it's a heavy place for Alicent. We see Caraxes hovering over Harrenhal as guys run past, and then Daemon is directly compared to Aemond, both wearing some swanky sleepwear. Yes, Aemond sleeps with a sheathed sword in his belt. Of course he does. At the small council table, Aemond tells that he eagerly awaits a fight with Daemon. Paired with Aemond's fangirling and chest puffing at Daemon in episode 8, the show is really hyping up this rivalry. So that'll be cool, and I'm very much looking forward to the dynamic of a meathead incel and a flawless psycho egging each other on. A crowd of smallish folkish throw some medieval confetti onto this funeral procession Alicent and Helena are in. Otto tells, it cuts to Aegon later, but I assume he's talking to Alicent because he's using his hushed private conversation voice instead of his council voice, and why would he need to convince Aegon that it's violence time? He seems pretty on board with that already. Yeah, he's saying that the only way forward to a peaceful and prosperous realm is through a big violent war. We see a Bracken girl, or Twink, or both, draw steel against some Blackwood lads. The Brackens and the Blackwoods are like the eternal rivals of the Riverlands, being neighbours of different religions with a deeply intertwined history going back many thousands of years. In season one, Rhaenyra saw Willem 
Adam Blackwood slay Gerald Bracken in Storm's End over some petty insults, and we later hear about a land dispute between the houses that Rhaenyra is concerned will erupt into war. They seemingly take up any opportunity to fight one another. The Brackens and the Blackwoods will use any excuse to spill each other's blood. So naturally, they take opposite sides in this Targaryen civil war, with Daemon setting up shop at Harrenhal with plans to speak to the Tully of Riverrun, who is superior to both of these houses. The house on the black side will probably have an advantage in this conflict. The teaser trailer shows Daemon beheading someone in front of a weirwood, and there is a dead weirwood at the Blackwood seat, Raven Tree Hall. Dead trees don't have leaves though, so maybe this is the weirwood at Harren Hall instead. There are a few named Blackwoods at this point in the book, so any of these guys might be Benjikot or Samwell or maybe a grown up Willem from season one. Someone is doing that really cool thing with a coin that I did once when nobody was looking and haven't been able to do ever again, just trust me. It's probably Aemond, because who else would be that cool, and also the next shot is him. He's got one of the council ball holders in front of him, but he doesn't have a ball. Maybe he doesn't need balls. In war, all sorts of customs go out the window. We see criminal Cole walking on what appear to be the walls of some castle, or some such structure. Given that he is a lame guy who doesn't even have a dragon, he's not flying around the country like Damon or Rhaenyra, so he's got to get everywhere either a foot or a horse. We know that Rhaenyra has a few crucial supporters in the Crown Lands close to King's Landing, so it would make sense for Aegon to send Chopper to quell all that before it gets out of hand. The closest of these supporters to King's Landing is House Darklyn, so this shot might be at their seat of Duskendale. In the book, the even closer houses of Stokeworth and Rosby have already been dealt with. Their lords were at King's Landing and detained by Otto when they refused to pledge for Aegon. In episode 9, this plot is instead given to Lord Merriweather, Lady Fell, and Lord Caswell. In the teaser trailer for season 2, we see Rosby and Stokeworth men alongside Green's soldiers, and Chain Chomp beheading a man at this location, so connect those dots. We see a servant or handmaid or whatever walking through a red keep hallway with a bloody hand and a blood-stained sheet. So yeah, blood has been spilled in the bed chambers of the royal house. Connect those dots too. Whoa, was that an Alt Shift X style zoomy outy editing move? Are we even allowed to do that? Is that legal? I thought he patented that. Aegon says, Good. To war then. And I love him, he's such a little goblin. A promo image has Tom Glincarney's Aegon recreating the Amok portrait, which is fun. Vagar through the clouds again, two drippy horses racing into battle, one of whom is a horse by Chlompo and he does a little scream. Get a load of his fancy necklace. Jeez, that might mean something. The other one might be Gwen Hightower, I don't know. We see Eric Cargill wiggling his sword around again. They really liked that shot. Then we slow down to an aerial shot of Aegon's high hill. Alicent in a churchy looking place, it might be the same sept from season 1. Remember, the great sept of Baylor from Game of Thrones doesn't exist yet, the Baylor it's named after hasn't even been born yet. Alicent speaks of her lifelong dedication to serve her house and do what she thinks is right for the realm, at the cost of her own personal desires. She goes for a little dip, maybe there'll be an emotional bathtub scene where she tries to process her life and figure out what's happening to her family, or maybe she's doing something drastic to herself. Looking up from underneath. Those creepy ethereal shots from the teaser do make me question how stable Alicent's mental state is, and I know a thing or two about unstable mental states. I've watched season 8 like 10 times. We see an army approaching this castle. The identity of this castle and what's going on here is confirmed only by leaks, so I won't say it, but it is a different location to everything else we've seen. The army here is very red, so connect those dots if you wanna. Baylor, a top moon dancer again, circling a forest while Clogo rouses his men. Get a hold of the rampant dragons on Aegon's stylish cardigan here. His mates Marty Rain and Leo Estamont are backing him in, they're from these places. And in the back here is Edded Waters. Waters is the Crownlands bastard name, so Edded is probably a Valarian bastard. Maybe Coley's son, maybe Vayman's son. In any case, he's probably the Green's claimant for Driftmark. None of these blokes exist in the book, so it'll be cool to see what becomes of them. The last thing we we see, rather crazily, is another dragon. 
Who would have thought? I initially assumed this was Helena's dragon Dreamfire as it somewhat looks like Daenerys dragons who probably hatched from Dreamfire's eggs. But no, this is actually Sea Smoke, Lenor Valarian's dragon. He's being prodded at by dragon keepers and the dark rocky terrain reminds me of the dragon mont from Damon's adventures in episode 8. So he might be on Dragonstone. Sea Smoke has an interesting place in the story as his rider is gone but not necessarily dead. So far as we know, dragons can only bond with one living person at a time. So if anyone is able to mount Sea Smoke, that would indicate to Rhaenyra that her first husband, the good man who helped raise her children, is now for real dead. Maybe the dragonless Rhaena, who the now dead Luke was supposed to one day marry, will be the one to claim her uncle's dragon. Or maybe someone else. So that's the green trailer. Overall, it's honestly mostly about how hard done by Alicent is. It gives us lots of hints as to what lots of characters are going to get up to, but still leaves a lot of unknowns. Room for excitement. In short, yeah, it looks pretty good. No bee guy though, so it'll probably suck. The structure of these things is a little lame though, you know, with the trailer starting now text. Bit cringe there. Not to mention the entire notion of presenting two different trailers for the two different factions and demanding that all must choose rubs me the wrong way a little. It's probably because I'm a little terminally online, but the rabid, blinding, honestly toxic factionalism didn't really need this encouragement, and I think it gets in the way of discussing the actual story. It's a cool concept, but I wish it were less insistent on validating the worst behaviours of the worst parts of the audience. We're all on the same side here, the side of a good story. Great trailers, exciting stuff, bothersome presentation. Only half an hour on four minutes of trailer. That's honestly pretty good. I've done much worse. Um, that's the video part of the video over, but there's some housekeeping here to tank the analytics. So press like to counteract that. And thanks for watching. Um, since I'm here, I might as well give you a Glidus glup date so you know exactly what I've been getting up to these days and maybe even vaguely what I've been getting down to. If you don't care, you can leave. That was, that was always an option. And you know what? Good riddance. I never cared about you anyway. Now that it's just you and me and all of these patrons whizzing past us, I can tell you that I've been working hard on more concurrent videos than ever before. The Q&A video where I'm going to yap about myself for like an hour, that, that one's done, but you haven't earned it yet, so it won't be coming out for a bit. I'm working on a couple of incredibly stupid things for Silly Week, which is damn soon. I can't tell you what those are, but one of them is a low effort shit post, and another one is a high effort shit post. As for main projects, I'm slowly whittling away at both the Battle of the Bastards piss take and a full season review of House of the Dragon. Dragon season one, but my current focus is actually not about dragons at all. It'll be about weird magic children as I dig into Netflix's avatar. Yay. Uh, somewhere amongst all that, I'm supposed to finish those acapella tracks too. And I'm going to America, apparently. <laughs> and I'm writing another album. Look, man, I'm fucking busy. Uh, sorry to all of you waiting for Got Review or the end of season six or one of the billion other things I said I'd do. I'm waiting for them too. But I'm not going to force them because then you wind up with mediocre crap that nobody cares about, like this video or this video. My dream would be to finish all of these things before House of the Dragon resumes on June 16. June 16, everyone, make note of that in your moon charts. But let's be real, that's that's not happening, is it? But if I shoot for the moon and miss, I might hit a few geostationary satellites on the way, so that'll be fun. Reflecting on this little thing called the past, I think I've got a face that there's just no way I'm producing full lengthy video essays on each episode weekly through season two, that's simply not possible. I will do them if the season warrants them, but let us not labour under the delusion that they will be at all timely. As a compromise, during the season I'll be making videos in a different format, shorter, less in-depth pieces that I should be able to produce without falling behind. Time will tell. Oh yeah, and I've been getting down to Pulp, The Police, and Joni Mitchell. That shit pumps. Uh, 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 um, I'm clearing my throat. Uh, um.